All right, everybody, here we go. We're going to jump into our next topic for the helping class. Last week, we talked about flourishing. And if you remember, the big takeaway from that discussion was how the help that matters is the help that leads people to human flourishing. It's the only help that really we ought to spend our time doing. Well, we're going to focus that idea to say that now the goal is to do work that helps people flourish and to do work that is unique to you and especially needed. The idea is that we can be most effective at helping in choosing the work that leads to others flourishing, but also the work that we are especially well suited to doing. The idea of this essentially is finding your calling as a helper. Now, uh, if there's one place you can turn for advice that's pretty much always going to be the same advice no matter what, it's graduation speeches. Advice along these lines of how you can find your calling is very similar to the advice given by, for example, Steve Jobs back in 2005. This is perhaps one of the most famous graduation speeches ever given. This was at the Stanford commencement in 2005. Steve Jobs is actually a pretty great speech, and I'd recommend you read it or watch it. It's quite compelling and not very long. Um, but, uh, but it contains a version of the same advice you're always going to find. And in the case of Steve Jobs, this is what he had to say. Don't lose faith. I'm convinced that the only thing that kept me going was that I loved what I did. You've got to find what you love. Now, this is the way he phrased it, but you'll find it often phrased in other ways, perhaps most commonly this way. Follow your passion. The idea is that what is that whatever you pursue in life, it should be the thing you care most about. And essentially the, the path, the guide, the path, the way to great happiness professionally is to make sure that you're pursuing the thing that makes you most passionate. Well, I'm here to tell you that follow your passion is bad advice. Now, it's interesting to note that this has not always been the dominant career advice. In fact, it's probably only been over the last few decades that this is the advice that most students have been given when they're setting out on their careers or, cho or choosing their majors. Uh, we might even chart the origin of this to a particular moment. Uh, this is Joseph Campbell. And, uh, and he was, uh, he's the, uh, the, the um, literary scholar who created the idea of the hero's journey. He sort of recognized it in most literature and most fiction anyway. There's this sort of arc of a story that he calls the hero's journey that has very common attributes, where the hero goes from obscurity to accomplishing some great deed and all the things that happen along the way. And you see the hero's journey mapped out over and over again in stories that, that span both culture and history. And so this observation of his that came in the book called The Power of Myth is, it was a really potent one and got him a lot of notoriety. In 1985, he gave an interview um, with Bill Moyers on PBS. And in that interview, he talked about the idea of following your bliss. And he described it this way. He said, if you follow your bliss, you put yourself on a kind of track that has been there all the while, waiting for you. And the life that you ought to be living is the one you're living. Wherever you are, if you are following your bliss, you are enjoying that refreshment, that life within you, all the time. And so he's essentially describing the life of purpose and not just purpose in a general sense, but the, but the purpose that's unique and specific to you. And that when you live out that purpose, this is what he described as following your bliss. Well, there's a problem with the word bliss. He's using a translation of a Sanskrit word. But, but not using in the way that most people use bliss, which is the idea of sort of like unsullied enjoyment, right? Uninhibited by negative feelings. Um, that's not the way that Joseph Campbell meant the word bliss. And in fact, a lot of people started to interpret this idea of follow your bliss and started using it in ways that were sort of intended to free people from any burden. The idea being that you shouldn't do things that bring you down. And, and choose the things that just bring you happiness and joy and shed everything else. And so it became sort of a watch cry of, of very hedonistic arguments and perspectives. And, and later on in 2014, a journalist uh, asked Joseph Cannibal about this and how this idea of follow your bliss had sort of been commandeered by people who use it as an excuse for just mere pleasure. And he responded, maybe I should have said follow your blisters. 
Well, what did he mean by this? What he meant was is that the things that truly mark that path that he was talking about, that path of, of unique purpose, that, that path is marked by hard work, by setbacks, by disappointment, but by perseverance in the face of, of difficult things. And so this first idea I want to introduce is this one, that uh, you know, you're more likely to find your calling in the blisters than in the bliss. And so the first question you ought to ask yourself is, what, are you willing, what am I willing to earn blisters from doing? The thing that you get lost in, in the midst of effort, the thing that you are dedicated to no matter how hard it is, this is one of the first indicators of where you're likely to find your calling and the ways that you can be most helpful to others. Now, calling is actually a field of scholarship, and there are quite a few people who will research how people find their calling in life or at work. Uh, two of those scholars are Dr. Jeff Thompson and Stuart Bunderson. Um, Dr. Thompson teaches here at BYU, as many of you know. Uh, Dr. Bunderson uh, teaches at University of Washington, St. Louis. Together, they uh, did pretty groundbreaking research on how people find their calling. In one of their papers, they studied zookeepers. Uh, which is a profession marked by people with high levels of educational attainment, but low salaries, but yet they have some of the highest job satisfaction of any, of any profession. And what they found is there's a pattern to the ways that people find their calling. They embody a lot of those insights into what they call the seven heresies about finding your calling, the seven most common mistakes or misconceptions that people have about how to find your calling in life. I just want to review these seven heresies because they're really insightful. The first one is rarity, that only lucky people find a calling in life. A lot of people consign themselves to jobs or work or circumstances that they don't enjoy. And they assume that finding a calling is something that only the rare few are lucky to have. The second is uh, singularity, the idea being that everybody has just one true calling in life. Even Joseph Campbell sort of portrayed it this way, that there's this one path you're intended to follow. The research shows that that's not true and that people can find their calling in a lot of different paths. And in fact, people will find multiple callings throughout their life where they may feel like the work they have early in life is a calling and then they change careers entirely and find their calling in a new uh, profession or area of expertise. Uh, heresy three is predictability, the idea that we can somehow script our path to our life's calling. A lot of people stumble into their calling. A lot of people uh, find their calling in areas where they least suspect it. The fourth is necessity, the idea that you have to either choose your calling or providing for your family, that any calling is always going to be low paid um, and won't provide enough for your family. And so necessity is somehow a barrier to being able to find your calling in life. Um, that's not true. There are lots of people who find ways to live out their, their work that feels meaningful and like they're calling to them while also providing for their needs. Um, the fifth is felicity, the idea that when you find your calling, your work will be blissful. I think we've already sort of shown how that's not true. Um, but, uh, you know, Thompson and Bunderson really emphasize this point that every job as, as enjoyable and as satisfying as it is and how meaningful and helpful it can be to others, pretty much every job has, have, has aspects of it that are undesirable. The fifth or sorry, the sixth is glory. The idea is that if you'll find your calling, the world will take notice. It will bring you prestige. If you're living in your calling, that's not always true either. A lot of people find their calling in work that goes unnoticed, not unvalued in the sense that, uh, you know, they're, they're paid for their work. People appreciate the quality of their work, but maybe not necessarily in a, in a way that makes them famous. And the last is this idea of industry, meaning that, found, that meaning and callings are only found at work. There are a lot of domains in which you can find your calling in a way that's helpful to others that may not relate to an actual paid job. Now, one last concept I want to introduce that will help you maybe find your calling more quickly is this idea of ministered versus systematic help. Helping is often done in one of these two ways or maybe a blend of the two, but pretty much all help falls into one of these two categories. Ministered help is the kind of one-on-one -on -one help that we see. It's adapted to a very specific need. It's delivered to an individual. The thing about ministered help is although it's really well-fitting to the one person, it's also very hard to scale. So it's like a tutor teaching a student. 
Uh, the systematic help is the kind that is scalable, that's designed for broad needs and de delivered to large groups of people. Because it's capable of scaling, it also is maybe not as adaptable to individual needs. And so you can see there are trade-offs between ministered versus systematic help. And you may find that you have skill sets that lead you more to one of these versus the other, and that will shape the kind of job that you pursue. I think sometimes ministered help gets the lion's share of attention when it comes to help and, and, and finding work that's helpful. The reality is that systematic help can change a lot of people's lives for the better, too. I would also warn you, caution you against assuming too quickly which of these is where you'll find your calling. A lot of you have latent abilities in one or the other of these areas that you maybe haven't discovered where you would be really effective um, in either providing ministered or systematic help. Now, a lot of the way people think about their calling has to do with their jobs. Um, you know, the paid work we do is, is probably one of the ways we spend most of our time uh, in our waking hours, especially, uh, you know, in our 20s through our 60s. And so the, so the paid work we do is often where people try to find their calling and try to find work that's satisfying and meaningful and especially helpful to others. And that's why a lot of people who are natural helpers are drawn to what are called helping professions. Helping professions are those that, uh, that have the main activity of helping people with their pressing physical, individual, spiritual, psychological um, uh, problems. And, and so these are careers like you'd find in medicine, in teaching, in librarianship, in social work, public health, human services. Many government jobs involve helping professions. Many nonprofit jobs involve helping professions. These are jobs that are dominated mostly by the ministered kind of help that we talked about. They require strong skills in interpersonal communication, problem solving, patience, and compassion. You may already be drawn to a helping profession for the, for the path that you're pursuing. But I wanna talk about helping professions and about this idea of help and meaning at work because it can lead to a dark side. And, and one of the dark aspects of this is captured really well in this concept of vocational awe. This was a, a term coined by a librarian, Dr. Fobazi Etar. She had this really cool insight in a speech that she gave to other librarians not long ago. And she coined this term vocational awe to reflect the way we sometimes turn professions, uh, we sometimes refer to professions with sacred language to sort of make criticism of them inappropriate. The idea being that a job is holy and because that job is holy or sacred, it sort of justifies all deprivations or difficulties that the people in the profession encounter. She says the problem with vocational awe is, the, is that the efficacy of one's work is directly tied to their amount of passion or lack thereof. And she notes that if the language around being a good, and I wrote fill in the blank, she in her talk said librarians, if the language around being a good whatever is directly tied to struggle, sacrifice, and obedience, then the more one struggles for their work, the holier that work becomes and somehow more desirable. Well, you can see what would happen as a result of this. If, if, if the idea is that you're good at your job because of your sacrifice, your struggle, your obedience to the profession, then we're creating rife opportunities for those professionals to be mistreated. She notes that she wants to dismantle the idea that whatever job is a sacred calling, thus requiring absolute obedience to a prescribed set of rules and behaviors, regardless of any negative effect on the professional's own lives. If we, cre if we create this idea of vocational awe around a profession, we just create opportunities to mistreat the people in those professions. And we see that play out with nurses, with teachers, uh, e even with, uh, e even with uh, uh, frontline service jobs. Um, like during COVID, we talked about service workers with this sense of vocational awe, almost as an excuse for the mistreatment that they were receiving. Expanding upon this idea, I want to reference the work done by Dr. Aaron Seck. She's a professor at University of Michigan teaching sociology and engineering. And she wrote a book called The Trouble with Passion. And as a result of her research, multi-year study, a mixed methods study involving thousands of respondents using methods all the way from uh, individual interviews and, uh, and focus groups up to large-scale survey instruments. And the work was focused, and, and her research was focused on the importance of passion that people feel in their sense of work. What she found is that 75% of college students and 67% of college-educated workers 
great passion as more important to them than either job security or salary. <laughs> you can see how if passion ranks so highly in a person's preferences for their work, you can see how that might be abused or taken advantage of. Two problems with this overemphasis on passion are that first of all, it creates an opportunity for what's called choice washing, which is when upper income people view their career success as a result of hard work, that they earned it because of their passion and dedication. And then they therefore assume that low income people can also automatically succeed from hard work alone. And if they're not successful, it's because they weren't working hard enough. The idea that passion sort of becomes a proxy or a mechanism by which we judge others for career failures, not recognizing that there can be systematic or structural issues that stand in the way of career success. And as you can imagine, she also noticed in her work how passion preference allows employers to be exploiting of their workers around issues like compensation, work responsibilities, and so forth. So this dark side of an emphasis on passion, when we talk about calling on an emphasis of like sacredness in the helping professions, is something we need to grapple with and confront directly. Now, if you want to go into a helping profession or if you want to find work that's meaningful, but you don't want to go into a helping profession, don't despair. There's really good advice ahead. And here's how you can find success and have meaning at the same time in your work. Uh, this next slide is a formulation that you're going to see in a lot of different places, so I'm not going to cite it to a specific professional or scholar. Um, but the idea is that passion is an important element of your work. You have to find work that you enjoy. You certainly don't have just one passion that you can find meaning in. But to that passion, you need to add skill. You have to find work that you're good at or that you're capable of being good at with enough effort and practice. Because ultimately, to be successful in your career, it has to come with expertise. You have to do something that you're good at, better than most people. And then that skill and passion needs to be done in a domain or in an area with an output that's useful to others. If you're not producing useful work, the skill at which you produce it and the passion with which you produce it won't create sustainable circumstances for you. The combination of these three attributes are where you're most likely to find work that feels like a calling because you'll find work that's sustainable emotionally because of the passion, that's sustainable professionally because of the skills that you've developed, and that's sustainable economically because it's useful to others. Now, like I said, you don't have to find meaningful, helpful work just in helping professions. And Dr. Amy Rosneski is a pioneer in this space and did really cool research on a concept she called job crafting. And she is a strong advocate of the idea that helpful and meaningful work is not limited only to helping professions, but it usually happens outside of the helping professions when people engage in what she calls job crafting. And job crafting consists of three main activities. The first one is task crafting. This is where you add to or remove or alter your daily responsibilities. This is where you're doing a job, but by shifting your, the nature of your work on a given day, the kinds of tasks that you're doing, you can make that work more helpful to others and therefore more meaningful to you. The next activity in job crafting is the idea of relational crafting. And this is where you do what you do, but you change the people you do it with or for. And so it may be the case that you're really good at, at, at like organizing, right? That's one of your strengths is, is you're a great organizer of things. It may be the case that you just need to shift that capacity of organizing from one context to another. And where organizing is especially helpful to others, you can find great meaning in it. Um, and then the last activity is what she calls cognitive crafting. And this is where you just adapt or, 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 or change your, your mindset about the nature of your work such that you recognize ways that it's helpful that you might otherwise overlook or ignore. Dr. Thompson likes to reference a, a custodian he once knew at his previous university. And she was an incredibly joyful person and found so much meaning in her work because she knew the value it provided to everybody else in the building. And she knew how she was able, she recognized how she was able to improve the conditions to make their experiences in the building uh, just better and more, and more comfortable. And she found deep meaning in that. That's a great example of cognitive crafting. And there's really not a job area you're going to find where, you, where there won't be people who find deep meaning because of their, their mindset and other people who find deep dissatisfaction because their mindset isn't focusing on, on sort of the helpful, meaningful ways that they engage in their work. All right. And then this last idea I want to bring up that will help you have a more successful career path 
uh, in, in work that's impactful and beneficial to others is to develop what's called career capital by Dr. Cal Newport. Now, Cal Newport is, is actually a computer science professor, but he's written a lot and has developed deep expertise in how to do productive and meaningful work. And, uh, and he's written this book uh, called So Good They Can't Ignore You that summarizes his concept of career capital. And he has four rules for the people who want to develop career capital. The first is don't follow your passion, an idea that we fully explored by now. But his advice is learn to love work that is valued. What you love is not predetermined, nor is it fixed. You can learn to love things that maybe you didn't expect to. That was certainly the case for me when I went to law school. I never thought I would love tax law of all things, but I learned to love it. And that's what led me into nonprofit uh, law and then nonprofit management. And, and that opened the door for me in a way I didn't expect, but it was a matter of learning to love work that was valued. Number two, be so good they can't ignore you. This rule tells you to develop deep expertise, especially early in your career. Try to get to the bleeding edge of quality in the work that you do. If you excel at your work, then it will create opportunities for you to do more of the work that you want to do and more of the work that's beneficial and helpful to others. You'll be surprised where your expertise can be beneficial and open doors into areas you didn't expect. Number three, the rule is turn down a promotion. And what he means by this is maintain control over your work as much as possible. Often it, when you excel professionally, you're given opportunities to be in charge of management, to be in charge of resources or people. And with that comes a lot of administrative overhead. And you may find yourself doing less of the work that you want to be doing. Now, it may be the case that administration and leadership are skills where you find the deep meaning and opportunities to help. And I would say jump into that with both feet. But don't take promotions because of the prestige or even the increased financial resources if those promotions are going to pull you away from the work that you uh, feel like you should be doing. Rule number four is to think small but act big. The idea is to take frequent but small steps throughout your career, knowing that those will accrue. Now, if you don't have a unified career mission to, to like uh, orienting all of those small steps, you won't build something that has great impact on others. But if you sort of recognize over your career, that your small steps have focused toward an intended goal or impact, then you can have a huge impact on others because those small steps accrue to something really big. I hope this is all helpful. I, I hope that when you review this advice, you think to yourself, man, I can have a greater impact and I can be more helpful to others when I incorporate these ideas of finding passion, skill, and usefulness of crafting your job so that you're not narrowing yourself just to uh, careers that you maybe have assumed too much about. And also that you're recognizing that career capital is on you to build. And as you build up your career capital, you have more capacity to help others. So these are all academic uh, ways of talking and thinking about career capital. But uh, when we get together in class, we're going to review these together and then uh, review these together and then change topics. And we're going to talk about spiritual principles in class that can help you find your calling. And I look forward to that conversation. I'll see you then.